one. Okay, so for this particular section, it just says to match the curve represented by the parametric equations and then indicate the orientation of the curve. So with our parametric equations, we do have to, um, it's like as, well, for here, they're using T. And T just typically represents time. So essentially what's happening on your map or your graph is that as time goes by, you're at a specific location. And so that point moves depending on what part of time you're in, okay? So like if I start off at zero, well, then that's the starting point, right? The T equal to zero. But if I go to T equal to one, it depends on the measurement of time, right? T could be seconds, T could be minutes, T could be an hour. But then when I plug in T equal to one, that gives me a new location because that's where I'm at now, right? But you would have been traveling right throughout that time. So it's a consistent curve. It's a, a continuous curve. We just don't go and find every single little micro point leading from one point to the other, okay? We just kind of go in increments of one and it, and it kind of works. So for this particular, um, why do I have that? Oh yeah. So for this particular one, we start with t equal to zero and we'll use some more values like one, two, three, so on and so forth, just until we get an idea of where it's going and what it's doing. Um, so when t equals to zero, then that means x would equal zero cubed, which is just zero, and y would equal zero squared over seven, which is also still zero. So t equal to zero gives us the point zero for x and zero for y. So essentially this curve is starting at the origin, right? I'm not sure how I need to do my graph. I won't know until I get a couple more points. Um, and then if I do uh, t equal to one, I get x equals one cubed, which means I would get one for x. And then here I get zero, I'm sorry, one squared over seven. And so one squared is just one. And if I put that over seven, I end up with one seventh. So I get the new point, one for X and one seventh for Y. So that's the new point, one for X. And if I make this one, one seventh is gonna be pretty close to zero, right? It's just a tiny smidget, a one seventh of a way. But if I draw a curve to connect these, I have to put an arrow that tells me which direction I'm going in, which one was the first point leading to the second point, right? And since the origin was the first one and one and one seventh was the second point, I have to have the arrow going in that direction, okay? Now I noticed though, in the pictures, they had like another piece on this side. So there was multiple choices and they had another piece over here, okay? On this uh, negative side. So what you can do if you want to graph that is go t equal to negative one. But if you're looking at these coordinates here, right, t equal to zero, t equal to one, where would t equal to negative one occur? Would it occur after t equal to one or before t equal to zero? Right. Even though hypothetically, not even hypothetically, in application, there's no such thing as negative time, right? That's like going back in time which we can't do physically yet that we know of. Um, so let, if we wanna figure out what's going on when T equals negative one, we do have to plug that in, but we have to remember that this was literally our starting point now, and then it goes to this value, and then it goes to that value, okay? So when I draw my arrow, wherever this point is, it does have to have an arrow going to that origin because the origin is now not the original T value. So I'm going to get x equals negative 1 cubed, which is positive 1, and y equals negative 1 squared over 7, which is still 1 7. So coincidentally, I end up with 1 and 1 7. Oh, I made an error. What is negative 1 cubed? 
<laughs> yes. So it's actually negative one for X and one seventh, which is like right there. But again, T equal to negative one occurs before T equal to zero, which means I'm going from this point, negative one, one seventh to the point zero, zero. So when I connect these, I have to make sure that the arrow goes in that direction, okay? So when I'm going to select my graph, I need to make sure that it has those three points, but I need to make sure that the orientation is like going toward the right, right? Aren't my little arrows going toward the right? So it needs to match, okay? I naturally wouldn't have used T equal to negative one because my brain thinks in terms of time, but I noticed that the graphs had it in there. And so that's why I'm mentioning it for this video, okay? Um, let's see. Oh, I guess I just left myself a lot of space for that problem. But we'll go to the next one. It's very similar, but of course the functions have changed, right? X and T will have changed. So let me scroll up just a little bit. The same exact directions, okay? But this time we have x equal to the radical of t and y equal to t minus three. And so again, um, this one though, if you were to try to let t equal negative one, I just for observation purposes, I'm gonna show you what happened. Well, you can kind of know what happens. Can you plug in t equal to negative one? No, right? Because you can't take the square root, which means it would be imaginary and you can't graph the imaginary, right? So, I mean, you could graph it on a complex system, but this is a rectangular system, not a complex system, okay? So I cannot use T equal to negative one for this problem. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't. So we will have to start at T equal to zero. And then that would mean that X is gonna be the square root of zero and y would equal zero minus three. So we get the coordinates zero for x and negative three for y. And then we'll go to the next value, t equal to one. So I get square root of one, which is one, and then y equals uh, one minus three, which is negative two. So I get one and negative two. Now for the sake of making things easier on ourselves, what T value would be really convenient to pick next? Say it again. Exactly, because we're gonna have to take the radical of it, right? Exactly. So we'll do T equal to four and see where that goes. Um, that would be four, which is just two. And then we would have four minus three, which was one. So we get two and one. So let's take a look at what we have. So we have zero and negative three first. Then we have one and negative two next. And then we have two and one. And I'm gonna connect the dots. Now remember, it went from this point to this point. So the arrow should be going toward that point. And then it went from one negative two to two one. So the arrow should go in that point, in that direction. So even if you see another graph with the same three points, make sure that the arrows are going in the correct direction, okay? If you see them going downward, that's not the correct graph, right? Oh, I am skipping something though, and I'm gonna have to go back to the previous problem. There were two parts of the directions, not just the graphs, okay? So the, gra the direction said to sketch the curve, right? But then it also said, write the corresponding rectangular equation by eliminating the parameter. So we did graph them both, and we made sure that the arrows were going in the correct orientation. But I'm gonna go back to example one and do part two, okay? Which is write the rectangular equation, eliminating the parameter. So the best way to eliminate the parameter 
is to solve one of the variables for t. Or if you can solve both of the variables for t, then that's still k2. That's another way. And then just set the expressions equal to each other. But here, I don't think I want to solve this one for t. Because then in order for me to get t by itself, won't I have to do the root? And when you introduce the square root, you have plus or minus, right? So I don't think that that's the one that I want to mess with. I could solve for t here using a cube root, and you don't have to do plus or minus for cube roots, right? So you just get one answer. So I'm going to take this one and solve for q, for t. I don't know why I said q. So I'm going to do the cube root of x. And then the cube root of t cubed. So then I get t is just equal to the cube root of x. And then now, since I have an expression for t, we're going to take this equation and we're going to substitute for t. Because when I do that, I end up with an expression just with x's and y's, right? And that's an equation in rectangular form, okay? But I can write this a little bit better. I'm pretty sure your computer will take this. I don't think it's a problem. They'll accept it. But you could write it as x to the 2 thirds over 7. And this is what um, I tried entering, and it accepted it. You might want to try entering that and see if it accepts it. They're the same thing, right? OK, and we'll do the same thing on the other um, example, too. For example two, For example two, it doesn't matter which variable you saw for, although one will require a little bit more algebra than the other, okay? Since this is already y equals, right? And that's normally how you want your rectangular equations, right? Is y equals whatever. Um, I would highly suggest solving this equation for t and then plugging it in so that you just get y equals to something, right? With x's in it. So I'm going to take this one and solve for t. And to do that, I'm going to have to square both sides. And so then I get x squared equals t. And then I'm going to plug that into the other equation. Oops. Yeah. So then instead of writing t minus 3, we're going to write what t is equivalent to minus 3. And then we have our, our rectangular equation. Okay. Okay. So now this one's were weird. The derivatives of parametric equations are pretty tricky. Um, and I personally get the second derivative wrong almost every single time I do this. And even though I'm, have taught this class a million times, I always forget. I don't know why. My brain just does not process the second derivative the way it's defined. Um, because in Cal 1, don't you get the second derivative by taking the derivative of the first derivative, right? But that's not how you get the second derivative when you're working with parametric equations. So <laughs> I always do it by default and I always get the wrong answers. Um, so make sure <laughs> when we get to the second example here for, and this is actually 10.3 stuff, okay? So it's still parametric equations, but now we're doing a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of um, calculus, very, very tiny. Um, we're just doing derivatives in this particular um, section, okay? So dy dx is pretty similar to kind of like um, your chain rule, right? So if you want to find dy, you basically take the derivative of y with respect to t, which looks like dy dt, right? And then if you want to find dx, that means you take the derivative 
of x with respect to time because your variables are in t and you get dx dt. So if you want to know what dy dx is, it's just dy dt over dx dt. Okay, that is the formula for um, the parametric equations. Now, you could, and this is totally plausible and okay to do. I don't mind you doing it. I personally would just rather follow the formula. But you could, if it's possible, convert this to a rectangular, right? You could convert this to a rectangular equation. And if it looks like y equals something, then you could just take the derivative of that, right? With respect to x. And you would find dy dx. However, sometimes it's not possible to write it a coordinated as a rectangular coordinated system. Or you get plus or minus, and then that causes, you know, you don't know which one to pick and it causes some issues, okay? So the easiest way for me to do these is just to follow that formula. So what is going to be my derivative of y with respect to t? So I'm looking at this guy, and what is the derivative of this with respect to t? Mm -hmm. That would be zero and then just minus six, right? Yes. And then what about the derivative of x with respect to t? That is this one. Mm -hmm. 2t. So then if I want to know what dy dx is, I'm just taking dy dt over dx dt. And then if you can simplify it, go for it but it doesn't really simplify much more than that. I think you could probably write it with the negative one exponent if you wanted, but there's nothing else you can do with that. Now this one, example two is the weird one. <laughs> okay, so it has, it kind of has it like in a chart form on your um, web assign. I didn't put it in the chart form, but we're still gonna find all of those four different things, okay? So first thing we're gonna find is dy dx, very similar to what we did for example one. Then we're gonna plug in t equal to one to find the slope when t equals one. And then we're going to find the second derivative and I'll give you the formula for that. And then we're going to plug in t equals to one in the second derivative to figure out what the concavity is at t equals zero or a t equals, okay? So we're basically gonna do one derivative, plug in one, do the second derivative and plug in one. And why am I plugging in one? Cause that's t value they gave me, right? If they gave you t equals to five, then you'd be plugging in five, okay? So first up is the dy dx. So we're gonna find dy dt first. What is the derivative of this expression with respect to t? It is, there's a four minus zero. So four only. And dx dt, I would rather write this as t to the one half, unless you memorized what the derivative of the square root of t looks like. It has to be done by power rule, right? So you bring down the power, you decrease the power by one. So one half minus one is a negative half. And then if the base wasn't just a t, I'd have to apply chain rule, but it is. So I don't need to multiply by the derivative of t, which is one. It doesn't change anything anyway. But I am going to write this as two over two square root of t. The one half exponent means a radical, right? A square root. But the negative means that that square root is downstairs. And then if I want to find dy dx, I'm basically doing 4 divided by 1 over 2 square root of t, which can be written as 4 divided by that fraction, which is the same as 4 times the reciprocal of that fraction. And so I actually end up with 8 square root of t. So this would be what you enter in the box for dy dx. 
Then when it asks you for slope, remember that slope is just dy dx evaluated at t equal to whatever they gave you. And for me, they gave me t equal to one. So I'm just going to plug in eight squared to one, which is eight times one or just eight. So that's the number you'll enter in the slope box. Okay. Now the second derivative, I kind of mentioned it, right? It's not the derivative of the first derivative. I thought that's our, our default <laughs> from Cal 1. But with parameters, it's not exactly the same thing, okay? In polar coordinates, it is. It does work that way. But when you have two different coordinates represented by a different letter, it doesn't work the same way. So here's the formula for it. You do take derivative with respect to time of a dy dt. So you will take the derivative of a derivative, meaning that's where the second derivative comes from, right? But at the bottom, you're just going to do dx dt, the original dx dt. You're not going to take the derivative of the dx dt. And if you don't use this formula and all you do is take the derivative of this, you will not get the correct answer. And I know, cause I literally did it all, I just automatically do it. And then it has red X and I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> there's a formula for this. Okay, so we're gonna basically take the derivative with respect to T of dy dt. Now dy dt was just four, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And dx dt, whatever that was, that was one over, oh, I wrote it wrong. I wrote it wrong. That's what's going on here. This is not right. And I will explain in just one second. dx dt, you said what? Two square root of t, right? That was dx dt. I have this formula wrong. So we're taking the derivative with respect to t, but not of dy dt. We're taking the derivative with respect to t of dy dx. So it's not this guy, is it? That's not dy dx, right? dy dx is this guy, isn't it? So that's what I need to take the derivative of. And I'm gonna write it in its power form so that I can eventually apply my power rule. And this formula is given on the final. So if there happens to be a problem that asks you to do the second derivative, that formula would be on there. The formula pages for this one is gonna be like ridiculous because it's all the formulas throughout the whole semester that we might need, okay? I try not to put all the other formulas that you won't need, just so that it's not too much that you have to scroll through up and down, but they will all be there. You know what? I am totally lying. There isn't even going to be <laughs> any formulas for the final exam. I was gonna wait to tell you about when we got to the final review, but um, for the final, you make your own review sheet. So you get one sheet of paper front and back, doesn't matter, um, but just one. And it has to be a regular size paper, like eight and a half inches by 11, not this giant <laughs> letter paper, um, but just one sheet of paper front and back. And I literally do not care what you write on it. So whatever you want to fit on that little paper, <laughs> it's on you, okay? Um, what formulas you want to write, if you want to have examples on there, all of that is completely up to you, okay? I would wait until we talk about the final review to start formulating that uh, note sheet, okay? So wait till we talk about the review and then you can start to figure something out to put on paper. Um, and then when you're doing the environment check for the final, you just basically show me your paper, run it back, and then you include it whenever you scan your stuff, okay? And that'll be it. Um, there's no rules to break us other than it just being one page. That's literally the only rule, okay? Um, okay, back to our problem. <laughs> 
So we do not do the derivative of this with respect to t. So we're going to have 8 as a constant multiplier times 1 half t to the negative 1 half. And we still have this down here, um, 1 over 2 square root of t. Now, you can do one of two things. You can actually start manipulating this and then try to reduce the fraction. But isn't this, this whole denominator, isn't it exactly 1 half t to the negative 1 half? This thing right here. Isn't that equivalent to 1 half t to the negative 1 half? Mm -hmm. So then what's going to happen is that this and this are going to reduce. And so what do we end up with is just eight. And I could have done more algebra, right? I could have kicked that T downstairs with the house. I could have multiplied by the reciprocal at the bottom, bunch of algebra, but essentially it would have still ended up with eight. And then for the concavity, Concavity, so it's just the y. Um, that's going to be your second derivative evaluated at the t value they gave me. So they gave me t equal to one. But there's nowhere to plug t, right? You can't plug in one because there's no t's here. So for this one, it just happens to be eight, okay? And that's a positive concavity, right? which means it will be concave up because it doesn't make you pick that from a drop down menu. There's only two options, concave up, concave down, I think an undefined or something like that. So it's not too, too bad the work. I do have, um, this one has a lot of examples. This section is a lot bigger than the 10.2. So that one should help. If this their second derivative had a t, then I would have plugged in one and then figured it out, right? It just didn't have a t. Okay. So the third example is, um, I missed the word equation. I didn't even realize that. It should say find an equation <laughs> of the tangent line at the given point of the curve, okay? And we have two, um, normally you follow this formula. In my videos, I always follow this formula. Y minus Y1 equal to M X minus X1 but I'm gonna manipulate it a little bit. So if I wanted y by itself, um, I'd have m x minus x1 plus y1, right? And the only numbers that you're gonna plug in are the m and then the coordinates of the point they give you, okay? They did give me the coordinates of a point. They gave me, so this is x1 and this is y1 but I don't know what M is, right? But we do know that M is found by doing dy dx evaluated at a certain T value. Problem is, is I don't know what that T value is, okay? So I've got to basically solve like a system of equations to figure out what this T value is. So I'm gonna do this on the side and I'm just gonna say to find the T value. So the system of equations is, is that this X should be negative three, shouldn't it? And this Y should be negative one. Okay. And so then you have that system to solve for T. Now you can go about it in two different ways. You could take the top equation and solve for t, then plug it in for t in the second equation, do all your algebra and find your answers. Or you could use like that elimination method that I was using when we were doing partial fraction. So I notice I have t squared and t squared. So what I would do is I would take equation one 
and I would multiply it by a negative one so that I would have negative t squared and then positive t squared would eliminate, okay? And I'm just gonna add equation two the way it is because I want one to be positive and one to be negative. So that would be positive three, negative t squared, and then a positive four. When I multiply everybody in equation one by negative one, and then equation two is gonna go right underneath. So when I do that, negative t squared and positive t squared will eliminate. Three minus one is two. And here, those are not like terms. So I get negative two t plus four. But then that's just a linear equation that I can solve, right? So I'm gonna minus four, minus four. I get negative two equal to negative two t divide by negative two, and I get that one equals t. Okay, so now I know how to find my slope. I'm gonna find dy dx and evaluate it at t equal to one. I'm gonna write a little note here, solve the system for t. So I'm doing in this little bubble. So dy dx is again found by doing dy dt over dx dt, and then eventually evaluating it at t equals to one. So dy dt is gonna be two t minus two, and dx dt is gonna be two t, and I have to evaluate it at t equals to one. So that's gonna be two times one minus two over two times one, which is zero over two, which is just zero. It's not always zero, but it just happens to be zero for this one. And I wanted to kind of cover it so that if you saw zero, you didn't freak out. It, it's possible it happens. So when I go to my equation, I'm gonna do y equals and instead of m, I'm going to use 0, x minus my x coordinate plus my y coordinate. But 0 times anything, right, is just 0. So I just end up with negative 1, y equal to negative 1. And this is the equation of the tangent line at that specific point. So if you get an actual number, you know, like five or one half or something, right? Then make sure you actually distribute that number and then combine the constants. But I definitely wanted to cover one where you got zero because that happened in the homework. So again, remember all these examples are always supplement, right? To what's in the discussion boards because the discussion boards has more examples. It's just, if there's one in there that I feel like I need to talk about again, then I will mention it again in class, okay? And I'm not counting any of the chapter 10 um, discussions late, just FYI. So if you didn't get to do the 10.2 or the 10.3 by wherever deadline it was, just go in there and do them and I'll give you the point, okay? I won't be doing the half credit if it's late for chapter 10. And then depending on the scores at the end, I might even just go back and not count anybody who did the late ones late. I don't know, it just depends. But whatever adjustments I do, I do it for everyone, not just one person, right? And I only do it if it's gonna benefit everyone, okay? So it's not gonna benefit everyone, I just don't do it. Um, but there are things that I can do at the end when I'm messing around numbers like 
You know, if I notice everyone has like two low homework scores and I'll be like, oh, let me drop two low homework scores because that'll make everybody's averages go up, whatever it is. Okay. I find things. <laughs> Any little bit makes those numbers go up, but just a tiny smidget. Okay. Not like a drastically, but still, if there's some student that's a difference between a B and an A by like point two, and I make these little changes and now they're in the A group. I mean, fantastic. Right. Um, I don't think that it should be that that crazy. Okay. So this one, I kind of put a little notes here. So remember when you're doing your derivative, right? When you're finding the slope, you're doing dy dx, aren't you? Okay. And in order for you to be a vertical line, or let's talk about horizontal first. In order for you to be a horizontal line, right, that goes like this, isn't the slope equal to zero, right? There's no incline and no decline, right? And the slope is just zero. Well, how does that happen? That only happens when the numerator here is equal to zero, right? So when you're finding your horizontal tangency, you're only figuring out where dy dt equals zero. Similarly, if we're talking about a vertical line, right? That's one like this. What is the slope here? You're Spider-Man, right? You can't walk on the wall. So this one is undefined. Okay. And how would you get undefined from slope? Well, that would be when your denominator is zero, right? So when dx dt is equal to zero, then you have that vertical tangent line. So, I mean, the formulas are great, but it's also nice to know like where this is coming from, right? Um, why it is what it is. Like, why is it that I do dy dt for horizontal and I do dx dt for verticals, okay? Um, now we have to actually just do the, the mechanics of it, okay? So for horizontal tangency, let's do those first. We're going to figure out when dy dt equals zero. So in that case, that means when 2t equals 0, which happens when t is equal to 0. Now, I notice I had made this mistake in the video, and then I went back later in the video and I corrected it. But if you were watching at the beginning, you might have caught me and been like, hey, wait a minute, you didn't give me the points. <laughs> of horizontal and vertical tangency. All you gave me was T, right? Not an actual point, like a coordinate, okay? So once I have that T, if I wanna find the point, I have to go figure out what it looks like. So X would look like seven minus this T value and Y would look like that T value squared. So what is the point? Seven comma zero for horizontal tangency, okay? Now for vertical tangency, that's gonna be x dt equal to zero. So if I take the derivative of x with respect to t, I would get zero minus one or just negative one. Can negative one ever equal zero? Never, never, never. So this implies that there's no points of vertical tangency. So I think in the computer, you just type none, okay? Or D and E, I don't know what which verbiage they want, okay? But you couldn't give me a T value, which means you can't find a coordinate, okay? So you try to take this derivative equal it to zero and find that T value, but since there's no Ts, you can't, you can't find a T value and you can't find the points, okay? So there's no points of vertical tangency. Pay attention in WebAssign because I'm not sure if it makes you select the word none or if it makes you type in DME. It'll be one of those two if that situation happens. Sometimes you get both. I think in the video we got both. I just wanted you to see what it looks like when you don't have a tangent point, 
Okay. Still have a few, and we're almost at an hour. I don't think we'll use the whole hour and 50 minutes, but that's okay. Um, and always use that extra time to work on web assignment. Okay, this one says determine the open T intervals on which the curve is concave down or concave up. So this, the new stuff is the parametric equation part, right? But the old stuff is just understanding Cal 1 material, right? What are we supposed to be analyzing for concavity? Do we analyze the original function? Do we analyze the first derivative or do we analyze the second derivative? Right? How do you know how to get concavity? So essentially, we're going to have to work with the second derivative. And we already mentioned it, right? When we had that one problem that asked us for the first derivative and then the slope and then the second derivative and the concavity, right? So you need that second derivative in order to find concavity. And essentially, if, the, if you plug in a T value into that second derivative and you get a positive, then concave up. But if you plug a T value into the second derivative and you get a negative, then it's concave down, okay? But we need to know which T value should we be plugging in, right? Um, so you have to basically take negative infinity to infinity and create intervals. Those intervals come from what they called critical numbers, right, in, um, in Cal 1. So critical numbers are where, um, I'm gonna write this down to find the critical numbers slash intervals find where the second derivative is equal to zero or undefined. So what does that mean? That means when um, when you have a fraction, right? You're gonna take the numerator equal to zero to figure out when the function equals zero. And you're gonna take the denominator equal to zero, right? To see where that function is undefined, okay? So let's start trying to figure this out. So first to get the second derivative, we have to have the first derivative. which is this formula. So dy dt is going to be 10t to the power one plus three t to the power two. You bring down the power and then take one away from the power, right? dx dt is going to be zero and then positive 10t to the first power. And if you don't want to use quotient rule, you should split this and then reduce them and rewrite them as exponents and all that good stuff. So, and I really don't want to do quotient rule because I'm going to have to take the derivative of this to get the second derivative. So I'd rather just do 10t over 10t plus 3t squared over 10t. Anything over itself is a big fat one. And then you get three over 10, but one of these t's cancel. And so you still have one t left on top, right? And you don't even have to write it like that. You could write it as 3 tenths times t, right? which is easy to take the derivative of. That's not too right. It's just three. It's derivative of one is zero. 
and the derivative of three tenths is t is just three tenths. But to get our second derivative, we have to do the derivative with respect to t of dy dx over dx dt. So dy dx is this, and the derivative of that, I'm gonna write this step. I don't usually write this step, but it helps when you look back. So the numerator would just eventually end up as just three tenths. But what goes at the bottom? Mm -hmm. dx dt i mean it's here right but you could also just go up to the original and take the derivative with respect to t but yes it is 10 t so you essentially have the numerator divided by the denominator or the numerator multiplied by the reciprocal of the denominator and you get three over 100 T. And you can keep it like that, right? Um, I would keep it like that. Keep it in its fraction form. Don't write it like this. Because I need it in fraction form in order to take the numerator equal to zero and the denominator equal to zero, right? So this form doesn't really help me as far as figuring out when the second derivative is zero and when it's undefined. Now here, the second derivative, second derivative is never zero. Why? Because when I take my numerator equal to zero, I get three equal to zero. And is three ever equal to zero? No. So you don't get any critical numbers from that part, right? From taking the numerator equal to zero. But if I take my denominator equal to zero, that would be the 100 T. I solve for T and I get T equals zero. So T equals zero is where the second derivative is undefined. Which means it's my critical number, okay? But I only have one critical number. So on interval, from negative infinity to infinity, I have one critical number and it's zero. And so now I have an idea of what T values I need to plug in to see if it's concave up or concave down, okay? So in this interval, I'm going to plug in uh, a test value, and it could be any negative number whatsoever, right? Because everything to the left of zero is all negatives. So plug in a negative number, maybe negative one. And then on this side of the interval, this interval, I'm going to try to plug in a test value t equal to positive one. And if I want concavity, I have to plug them into the second derivative. So I'm plugging them into this. So three over 100 times negative one is gonna give me a negative value, right? We don't care what the number is, just the sign. Three over 100 times one is gonna give me a positive number. So what does that mean? That means it's concave down on this interval, which is negative infinity to zero, and it's concave up on this interval, which is zero to infinity. And this is what they were wanting. They just wanted you to type in the intervals. But you wouldn't even know where to chop it, right? Unless you figured out what the critical numbers were. There was another one that had trig, so I definitely want to cover that one too. Um, 
just because we need to kind of go over Trig just a tiny bit, a little bit. Trig will come back into the story when we get to 10.4 and 10.5, because those are all about polar, and polar is sines and cosines, so Trig. That, that you see that board over there? That's the polar coordinate board. It helps to visualize it that way, but I don't ever draw my, I always draw the rectangular. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see, I'm gonna turn the camera and see if you can see. Let me stop sharing and see if they can see. Do you see this board here with the circles? That's the polar coordinate board. So we'll talk about polar coordinates in the next class. Come on, share my screen. There it goes. Okay, back to here. Okay, we're gonna try one more of these concave up, concave down interval things, but I wanted to talk about this one because it had traits. So all the same steps, we're gonna do all the same things. So I have to first figure out um, my first derivative. So dy dt, I'm sorry, dy dx is dy dt over dx dt. So what is the derivative of y? Cosine t. What is the derivative of cosine t? Almost. Negative sine t, there you go. And then what is the derivative of sine t? That one is cosine t, positive. Mm -hmm. Which is the same thing as saying negative tangent, isn't it? I always like to use my parentheses because the tan and then the t, <laughs> I can get lost. I mean, lose track real quick. Okay, now the second derivative is not negative secant squared t, right? That's not how you find the second derivative. You don't take the derivative of this, okay? You have to apply that rule. So if I wanna find the second derivative, I have to do d dt, the derivative of dy dx over dx dt. So I do have to take the derivative of this. It's just, that's not the only thing I need to do, right? So the derivative of tangent is secant squared. But because it was negative in front, I'm going to have negative secant squared. And then dx dt, I already have it on my paper. That's cosine. You can put this one in parentheses too if you want to be consistent. Now I just need to simplify that so that I can know what I need to set equal to zero. Um, this does actually simplify because it's negative secant squared divided by cosine t, which is the same thing as saying negative one over cosine squared. I'm gonna put the negative in the front. Times the reciprocal of this, which would be one over cosine of t. And then what do we end up with? We end up with a negative. So we have cosine cubed t downstairs. And so then if I want to take my numerator equal to zero, that would mean you could treat the one, the negative with the one. Just don't put the negative with both, right? If both of them are negative, then the fraction itself would not be negative. It'd be positive. So only give the negative to one person. I'm going to give it to the negative one because then it makes it kind of go away, right? Negative one is not going to equal zero. So there's no critical numbers from the numerator. But let's go see if we get any critical numbers from the denominator. So they want to know when cosine cubed is equal to zero. Well, I could take the cube root on both sides. 
which means I'm just looking for when cosine by itself and then cubert of zero is still zero. And where does that happen? If I look at my unit circle, it's the X value equal to zero. Well, the X value equals zero here and here on the unit circle, right? Mm -hmm. And it occurs all the time. So it occurs when T equals pi over two plus pi K. Do you remember that from pre-cal? These weird things. <laughs> this is horrible, but it, it is what it is. And we're going to have to keep doing it in the next two sections too. Because um, I was watching my videos back from 10.4 and 10.5, and I did not do a good explanation of explaining how you find just one petal of a uh, polar equation. I, I did something and I'm like, why on earth did I do that? I don't even understand where that came from. <laughs> so when I do the video, the supplemental video, the ones you got to watch for Monday, um, I will explain that a whole lot better because I did not explain it in the video. I just said, take pi over four and divide it by the number in front of theta. But why? <laughs> so I, I do explain it better the second time. And I'll change those videos in the future because it was not a good one. Um, so remember, we want all of the T values, but only the T values between zero and pi, okay? Because my T is bounded by that. So if I let K equals zero, right? Because that's what K is. K equals zero, one, two, three, so on and so forth. And that would give me all the numbers, right? All the times I go around. So when K is equal to zero, I this would just be zero. So I just get T equal to pi over two. That is inside the bounds, right? If I get K equal to one, I would have T plus pi over two plus pi. I don't even need to figure out what this is. Isn't it gonna be bigger than pi? So it's gonna be outside of my bounds, right? I'm supposed to be less than pi, not bigger than pi, okay? So I don't need to worry about any other answers. I'm only gonna get one critical number. And that is T equal to pi over two. So this is the only critical number I have, okay? So when I do my number line, be careful here, it does not go from negative infinity to infinity, right? Your T is bounded. Your T is bounded by zero to pi. We just happen to find a critical number which tends to be directly in the middle of those two, right? So when I draw it, it will be exactly in the middle. And if I'm trying to figure out what the concavity is on these two intervals that have been created, I have to plug in some test values and then I can figure out um, what the concavity is. So for this region, I'm going to plug in T equal to pi over four. And if you're not sure what to pick, my biggest advice is to look at your unit circle on that one page that has the unit circle in the notes. Um, look at that unit circle. And between zero and pi over two, you could pick, there's three different angles here. You could pick any one of those angles that you wanted. Those would be between zero and pi over two. I just picked the one in the middle, which was pi over four. And then between pi over two and pi, there's another three values. You could pick whichever one of those angles. I'm just picking the one in the middle, which happens to be T equal to three pi over four. So let's plug them into our second derivative. Where's our second derivative? That's our second derivative. So we're gonna plug them in there. So negative one over, I'm gonna do cosine of pi over four cubed. Cause I cannot type cosine cubed in my calculator. I have to type in the cosine of whatever and then cube it. And then the same thing over here, negative in front, cosine of three pi over four, then I have to cube that. And I don't care what the number is, I just care whether it's positive or negative, right? Second, clear, clear. So I'm gonna have negative fraction one over parentheses cosine of pi over four. Now I need to close the parentheses for the cosine 
but then I need to close the parentheses that's in front of the close sign. And then I can cube it. So it's taking the cosine of just pi over four, but then that whole quantity, it's gonna cube. And I get a negative answer. Now I'm gonna do the same thing again, but I'm gonna add a three in front of that pi. So three pi, and then try it again. And this one gives me a positive. So that means it's concave down for this interval, mm -hmm, which is zero pi over two. And then since this one's positive, it's gonna be concave up for this interval that I was testing, which is pi over two to pi. So we're kind of getting into a little bit of the calculus of it, even in the next, when you watch the videos, because it's not actual like in-person class, but um, when you do 10.4 and 10.5, it's going to be polar coordinates and a tiny bit of calculus and polar coordinates. But when you get to Cal 3, if you're taking Cal 3, they're going to go crazy with it. So <laughs> we just need a little tiny bit of basics so that when you get there later, it'll kind of make sense or at least jog back a little bit of memory. Um. Let's go ahead and do, I think I have one more. This one's a little bit different. It says arc length. We definitely need to know the formula for arc length first. So it's gonna be from A to B, the square root dx dt squared plus dy dt squared and then dt. Now I will um, warn you guys, if you're going, use formulas on your note sheet when you create your note sheet um, in addition to whatever examples you put. Don't forget to put the formulas instead of just the examples because if the function is not exactly the same as the example you chose, um, it could lead to confusion when you're taking that final exam, okay? You're like, what am I supposed to be doing? Where am I supposed to be going with this, okay? Not, <laughs> not only that is if you are using examples, chances are you're gonna start writing the numbers from your example down on your work paperwork for the exam, then the problem, the numbers that were actually from the exam. So it happens a lot. So the only, I guess, advice I gave you, try to use the least amount of examples, more formulas. But again, it's your prerogative, whatever you want to put on your note sheet. Just be careful because <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times people start using the problems, the numbers from their example instead of the numbers from the actual problem you were given. It's like, for example, if I had this exact example on my paper, but the problem on the five had like zero and four. And then toward the end, you're plugging in negative one and three, like your example says, but that's not what you were supposed to plug in for the problem you were giving. You were supposed to plug in zero and four, okay? So just be very, very, very careful. Um, so I am gonna do this formula. We get kind of lucky because we do get the bounds, right? We don't have to think about it for the parametric equations. They give us the bounds. This is gonna be my lower bound and this is gonna be my upper bound. The only pieces I need is the dx dt and the dy dt, but that's not too hard um, to find. So I'm gonna write s equals from negative one to three, a big giant square root, and then dx dt is what? Mm -hmm. It's just six, which gets squared, plus, and then dy dt, Just negative five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, eventually it will turn to 25. And then we're going to put the little dt over here. 
And that's nice because it's just numbers, right? So we get 36 plus 25, which happens to be the square root of what, 61? And you can try to simplify that in the calculator, but I don't think it does. No, it stays square root of 61. So just, you could take it out if you wanted to, but what is the integral of any constant? Is just that constant times the variable, right? So when I take the derivative of that, I just get the square root of 61, right? But I have to evaluate this at the ends. I don't like to do this in both parts. So I'm just gonna plug in three for T minus and then plug in one for T. And I get four, which is just four square root of 61. And I think it asks you for decimal places in the web assign. Um, I think it's like three decimal places or something. So four square root of 61. It doesn't simplify, but if you hit that double arrow, it'll convert it to a decimal. So it's three, 1.24, and the nine will change that zero to a one. And so this is your arc length. That is it for this section. Okay. We've really gone over with with the vid with the examples that are in the videos and all of the examples that we've covered today. You should have examples for every single problem in the homework sections. Okay. 10.2 and 10.3. Does anybody have questions? Yes. Example two. That's just, this is the symbols of how you write the second derivative. This is how you write the second derivative. But it doesn't mean you're squaring X mm -mm. or DX because then that would be in parentheses, right? No, it's just notation. Yes, it does. <laughs> and we don't ever use that notation. Like me personally in Cal 1, I don't, I use this notation versus this notation. I just don't use that notation when I'm doing Cal 1. Okay, but in here they do use it because all the T's are involved and there's some other stuff going on, right? But they're the same thing. Even a cube, not a cube, a, um, a derivative would be cube here, but then the cube here. So it's weird. Well, there would be a different formula for that. So that formula would actually be, if we're doing in parametric stuff, if you wanted to do this in the parametric pair, God, I can't say that word. Parametrization, I cannot say it. <laughs> it would be the derivative with respect to T of the second derivative. But then in the bottom, it would just be dx dt by itself. Mm-hmm. It's always just dx dt by itself at the bottom. And second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative, doesn't matter. Okay. But it does have that normal cascading effect with the numerator, right? The numerator you get from taking the derivative of the first derivative and then the derivative of the second derivative, the derivative of the third derivative, right? That's what we're used to in Cal 1. But in par I can't say the word, <laughs> but when you're parametrizing, you always have to divide by dx dt for all of the um, second, third, fourth, fifth derivatives. Okay, good question though. Any other questions? If you do come up with questions later, like as you're working on your web assign, just make sure you message me 
Um, you can message me in Canvas, but I prefer you that you message me in Remind just because it goes straight to my phone and I'll likely answer it faster. Um, but you definitely can message me either place, Aces, Canvas, wherever. Even when I'm out on that week, I'm still going to be replying um, to messages all the whole time. I've told all my classes that like you can still message me Monday. I mean, shoot, you could even message me on Thanksgiving Day if you happen to be on something because I decided to make my own turkey and stay at home. <laughs> so I shouldn't be able to answer questions if you have them even on that day, if you were to be doing something. I don't recommend it. I mean, take the day off. <laughs> but if you happen to be, I'll still be available. Um, okay, well, that is the end of 10.3. So I'm going to stop this recording. And then um, let's see. And